Good morning and welcome. Really, really um, delighted to have you here and also welcome to the 270 people streaming in um, to see Dr. Ross's presentation online. Uh, I'm Dr. Kim Dennis. I'm the co-founder, CEO, and chief medical officer at SunCloud Health. We are uh, a fully integrated treatment center serving adolescents and adults. Uh, we have two residential units in the Chicago area and then PHP and IOP, three sites in Chicago, and a new site in Gaithersburg, Maryland. I'm thrilled to have a rock star in the house today, Dr. Coca Ross, who's flown to be here to give us a talk on such an important and um, under-talked about uh, issue. So she's going to be talking to us today about ac acute chronic and intergenerational historical trauma in the development of eating disorders and substance use disorders. Carolyn Coca-Ross is an MD, MPH, and CEDS. She's an African-American author, speaker, expert on the treatment of eating disorders, trauma, and addictions. She is a graduate of the University of Michigan Medical School, completed her residency in preventative medicine, and a master's in public health at Loma Linda University. She also completed a fellowship in integrative medicine at the University of Arizona. She's board certified in preventative medicine and in addiction medicine. She completed certification by Cornell University in diversity, equity, and inclusion. Dr. Ross has been an international speaker and consultant on issues of mental health, trauma, and workplace productivity. She received an award for outstanding service in addiction medicine in 2022 from Friendly House in Los Angeles and the Dr. Peter Hayden Diversity, Inclusivity and Racial Equity Award from the National Association of Addiction Treatment Providers, NATAP. Dr. Ross presented a TEDx Pleasant Grove talk on historical and intergenerational trauma in January 2020. She's the co-founder of the Institute for Anti-Racism and Equity, a consulting group that offers trainings to organizations on diversity and equity in the workplace. And I encourage you all to check out that organization. It's an amazing organization and most institutions need um, more and more of this kind of training. So thank you. Uh, Dr. Dennis and I go way back. <laughs> Obviously, I'm older than she is, but we met when we were both just spring chickens in this field, I think. So this is a big topic, and I just want to let you know I'm, I'm in an hour. Obviously, I can't cover everything that I'd like to, so you'll have to have me come back. But um, I will be mostly centering the uh, African-American experience in this presentation when we go more in depth. So here are the objectives. And I want to start by just talking about how trauma in childhood leads to the problems that all of us are seeing and treating in adults. Um, there's you know, lots of studies on the effect of life experiences, particularly those that occur in children. And so this is not new. The, the, um, Adverse Childhood Experiences Study, which started at Kaiser Permanente in San Diego, where I live, it's, is over 20 years old. And the CDC has now expanded their research on ACEs to include another ACE, which is adverse community environments, as also contributing to trauma in children. And as you know, the ACE study has shown that childhood adversity is associated with an increased risk for over 40 medical and psychological conditions, including substance use disorders. So here is uh, the new, um, instead of the pyramid, they're using this tree approach. At the top are the things they've been studying for the last 20 years as, as adverse childhood experiences. And then the roots, and I think that's really metaphorically perfect, the roots of these experiences come from poverty, discrimination, community disruption, lack of opportunity, economic mobility, and social capital, poor housing quality and affordability, and violence. So basically, the roots center from the effects of systemic racism. 
So we know that substance use disorders and trauma go hand in hand, and the impro improper diagnosis and treatment of these co-occurring disorders is one of the factors that explains the extremely high relapse rates that we see in substance use disorder programs, especially when trauma and PTSD are not diagnosed and treated. So this is the, the proportion of certain um, disorders that are related to adverse childhood experiences. And for substance use disorders, 63% of what we see and the risk is related to adverse childhood experiences. And you can see some of the others, which, you know, when I went to medical school, nobody talked about trauma ever. And we certainly didn't talk about trauma as an underlying root cause for, you know, heart disease, depression, alcohol use disorder. What about suicide risk? Ne no, that was never mentioned. So I think we have a long way to go to catching up on both diagnosing and treating these root causes. So uh, this slide just shows you some of the statistics compared to people with no adverse childhood experiences, which is really only 30% of the U.S. population that have zero childhood adversity. Those with five or greater ACEs were seven to 10 times more likely to have a substance use problem and use IV drugs, et cetera. 89% of those seeking treatment also have a history of at least one traumatic experience. Uh, there's a significantly higher level of trauma and PTSD in individuals with substance use disorders and so on. So I think the evidence is in and we really need to really be focused on how can we help people recover from trauma, not just be abstinent from their substance use disorder. Now, while the Adverse Childhood Experiences study did not look at eating disorders specifically, there have been a plethora of studies, including many by uh, Dr. Brewerton, Tim Brewerton, that have shown that eating disorders are highly associated with trauma, and especially in those with post-traumatic stress disorder. And this effect can be found in women and girls, boys and men, adults and children, may be more prominent in uh, people with bulimia and may not affect the severity of eating disorders. Uh, that we don't know, but again, for many years in my career, uh, people in the eating disorder sphere denied that trauma had anything to do with eating disorders. And there's a specific resistance to associating trauma with anorexia nervosa. Uh, the golden child of eating disorders. <laughs> so here's some of the things that research has, has shown. I'm not going to read those for you, but um, I think that gives you kind of a sense of what we are seeing. So the question of how trauma in childhood can lead to these adult diseases is really an important one. And in the beginning, mainly it was thought to do with the environment, like parenting was bad or uh, something like that. Um, but more and more we're focused on the fact that the answer has to do with the brain. Now how does trauma impact the brain? I don't have time to go into all the details, but I refer you to Dr. Bruce Perry's work and particularly his really impactful book, The Boy Who Was Raised as a Dog. I don't know how many of you have read that. Yeah. It's, a, it's, it's a worth the read. It's hard to put down and it's also hard to read. Um, but the work that he's done really helps us to understand these brain effects. So his, he has said that although experience may alter the behavior of an adult, experience literally provides the organizing framework for an infant and a child. So everything that happens to a child, the day-to-day -day lived experience of children in our communities, in our families, and so on, shapes the architecture of the brain. So if they're neglected or abused versus if, you know, parents read to them, they have a supportive family, et cetera, et cetera, that's how the brain will develop. 
and the uh, brain development is, is shaped by both genes and experience. So genes provide the blueprint, but early experiences determine how strong or weak the neural circuits will be. And in this area, we have to talk about the new science of what we're learning about epigenetics, which relates to child development. So number one, epigenetics helps us understand how childhood experiences affect the expression of a child's genes. So experience doesn't change the DNA. You know, that takes generations and generations and generations, but it changes the expression of our DNA so that a gene, for example, for a substance use disorder can be turned on by experiences in childhood. We're now seeing biochemical marks on our genes. You see that little with the DNA thing? Um, those marks on the genes um, determine how these genes are expressed. Childhood experiences can affect the arrangement of these marks. So childhood adversity can literally hijack a person's potential in life. And that, I think, is we need to kind of pause and think about that because while many children are born with genes that may predispose them to substance use disorder or other genetic types, diseases, uh, depression, anxiety, heart disease, diabetes, et cetera, um, while genes can be turned on for those diseases, they can also be turned off. So when you think about a child born into this world with, uh, you know, whatever genetic potential they have, and then you think about children who are born into poverty, who are born into families that are abusive, and how their potential is derailed by these early experiences. So our genetic makeup is not set in stone. Genes interact with the environment to make us who we are and explain how early experiences have this lifelong impact. So the brain of young children is especially vulnerable to the impact of, of these early life experiences because it's growing so fast. Uh, while epigenetic effects can lead to the over 40 mental and physical diseases I mentioned earlier, um, epigenetics can also have this positive effect. So things like things that are protective are things like prenatal care, good pediatric care, supportive parents and caregivers, enriching childhood experiences and supportive relationships in the community. And those can literally activate genetic potential. So the CDC's goal is for every child to have nurturing, safe, supportive environments to grow up in. It's a lofty goal, but just imagine what the world could be like if we, if our work here today was not caused by these uh, adverse childhood experiences. So the bottom line is, wherever you go, you take your trauma with you. So this guy is checking in for his flight, and he said there's a nominal fee for that emotional baggage. <laughs> yeah. Um, I love to say this, wherever you go, you take your trauma with you because I think we only tend to think about trauma as causing psychological problems, but we know that trauma affects our productivity in the workplace, our relationships because of effect on attachment relationships in childhood, how we perform in school, whether we complete high school or college our friendships, how we parent, and even how we manage our finances. So some of the things that we've been considering, like, oh, you know, well, those folks just don't know how to manage money, or those folks, they're not smart enough, and that's why they're in poverty. Look at, look at the facts. I mean, there are statistics to support each of these um, things here. So let's, um, so I wanted to give you, I'm sure most of you have already done your own individual um, ACE quiz, but I find that many people in our profession tend to not do their own stuff and, and just want to work with patients. So this is a, a QR code plus a link to the quick, quick, quick ACE quiz where you can get your own ACE score. And we know that a score above four um, is significant, but 
even above, even at one to four, there are significant changes. So we've talked a little bit about individual ACEs, and now I'd like to talk about race-based trauma. So race-based traumatic stress is racial trauma. Race-based traumatic stress refers to the mental and emotional injury caused by encounters with racial bias, ethnic discrimination, racism, and hate crimes. I would also add in there the day-to-day -day effect of microaggressions. Um, so how does it play a role? Um, well, we know that studies have shown that adverse childhood experiences as well as the adverse community environments are more common in people, uh, children of color. From the National Survey of Children's Health, we know that black children are more likely to have higher ACE scores compared to white children. And they're overrepresented among children with two or more ACEs, so more severe levels of trauma. Finally, individual and interpersonal racism is significantly associated with every other ACE. For example, individual and interpersonal racism increases the risk for parent having a parent or guardian in jail by 2.3 times, witnessing uh, violence or having neighborhood violence by 6.3 times, even after controlling for other factors. So it's kind of like a slippery slope, you know. A child is born into a family that may be well-meaning, uh, somewhat educated, but poor, living in uh, neighborhoods that are, um, you know, limiting and so on. And then that leads to that, and then it leads to that, and then it leads to that. So it's that domino effect. We can't ignore the importance of systemic, systemic issues, systemic racist issues, and their influence on everything else. And I, I often speak to people about, you know, diversity, equity, inclusion, racism, and so on. And it's not uncommon that, uh, you know, people will say, well, you know, I had a black patient and they, um, you know, they just kept missing their appointments. And I don't think it has anything to do with their race. But I would say the opposite. It has everything to do with their race. And we need to start thinking in that direction instead of denying the association with race. So, for example, living in segregated housing is associated with adverse birth outcomes. Increased exposure to uh, air pollutants, as we've seen with the lead disaster in Flint, Michigan. Um, shorter lifespan, increased risk of chronic diseases, as we saw with the COVID, where COVID was killing more black and brown people because of the number of chronic diseases that they had. Increased rates of homicide and other crimes, adverse cardiovascular outcomes, and incidence of high blood pressure, engagement in high-risk behaviors, alcohol use, poor sleep. And then daily microaggressions experienced by black men and women is a source of stress that is unrelenting and physically and emotionally harmful. I saw a little cutesy video on YouTube explaining what is a microaggression. And they were comparing microaggressions like uh, to uh, mosquito bites. So, you know, two, two people in the video, a white person and a black person were standing at a bus stop and the black person kept, you know, like <laughs> slapping themselves because they were being bitten by uh, mosquitoes. I, you know, I think that's a valiant attempt to help people identify with what's going on, but it really doesn't give the magnitude of, for me, mosquito bites are huge because every single one swells up to like three times its size and, you know, and so on and so forth. But if you're just a, person not like me who's allergic to them, you would think, oh, what difference does it make if you're getting bitten by mosquitoes? Well, what if it is happening every day, all day? How does that feel? And then magnify that times three. Um, okay, so we've discussed individual. This is, do black children who experience racism have higher ACEs? And you can see on this chart that, yes, they do. That's all of the dark black line. Okay, let's switch now and talk about 
intergenerational effects of trauma. And this is what I spoke on in my TEDx talk at TEDx Pleasant Grove, was uh, the gifts of intergenerational trauma. I had to struggle to find those gifts, but they are there. <laughs> They're not just right on the surface, though, I'll tell you that. Uh, so here's the definition we use for intergenerational trauma. It occurs via a variety of mechanisms, including the impact on attachment relationships, the impact on parenting and family functioning, the association with parental physical and mental illness, disconnection and alienation from the extended family, culture, and society. Now, any of these effects are exacerbated by continuing levels of stress and trauma in including multiple bereavements and other losses, the process of vicarious traumatization, where children witness the ongoing effect of the original trauma. So you could think of that like uh, your mother was in a domestic violence relationship, and then you, as her daughter, end up in those same relationships. And you know, it just goes on and on, and then you witness your daughter being, so that's the ongoing effect of the original trauma in which, you know, and you can apply that also to race-related trauma. Even where children are protected from the traumatic stress of their ancestors, like people who are offspring of Holocaust survivors, most of, many of the Holocaust survivors didn't talk about their experiences, and yet the children showed marked um, effects. So even when children are protected from these traumatic stories, the effects of past trauma still have their impact on the children in the form of ill health, family dysfunction, community violence, psychological morbidity, and early mortality. So let's look at, I didn't list all, for the sake of time, all of the research here, but I wanted to show you a couple because the first one shows that we've been looking at this kind of thing for quite some time. I mean, when was the Civil War? Who remembers their history? But sons of U Union Army soldiers who endured grueling conditions as prisoners of war were, were more likely to die young than sons of soldiers who were not prisoners. So these are the sons of the Union soldiers who were prisoners. Their sons had shorter lifespan than those who had never been prisoners. And the sons were born after the war, not during the war. So they couldn't have experienced the horrors of the war personally. In other words, it seemed like the stressors of war were getting passed between generations. And so in another twist, uh, the, a paper on this showed that sons could be protected from their father's trauma if their mothers had good nutrition while they were pregnant. And that, again, is consistent with epigenetic research. So when there's a trauma, the germ cells in the father's, you know, testicles, the sperm cells that go, go on to make the son, have been affected with this these epigenetic effect, turning on genes for whatever disease. I think my favorite study is this animal study where they took um, mice, I believe it was, or rats, some kind of rodent. I try not to look at those pictures. Um, but um, they, they paired the smell of cherries with an electrical shock. So, you know, they were exposed, give, give them the smell of cherries, and then buzz. Okay, they had children, and then their children had children. So mice babies and mice grandbabies all had extreme fear of the smell of cherries, even though they had never been shocked. And that went down two generations. I think that's a really cool study, and it's what we actually see in real life, too. OK, so stress from racism may also call, cause epigenetic changes. And we see biochemical proof of this now uh, with a type of epigenetic change called methylation on the genes that affect schizophrenia, bipolar disease, asthma in people who have um, experienced stress from racism. Common symptoms of intergenerational trauma you have listed here. So these are things that we see clinically every single day. Irrational fears. Why is this person afraid of everything? Why 
can't this per person establish close relationships? Well, why is there such a lack of trust? Why are they I engaging in risky health behaviors? And on and on. So these are some of the ones that have been paired in studies. Uh, and it just shows uh, that many describe these as survival mode behaviors. And we know, and this has been a term that's been used for some time, we know that our patients present in survival mode. Uh, and, and that's how, how that shows up. For example, though, a client who expe expresses fear or distress of law enforcement or uh, of going to see a doctor, which both of which are very common in the black American population, they may not have a personal experience that prompts that fear. When asked where they think the fear originates, they may answer, I'm not sure, but this is what I've always heard. This is what my parents say. This is what my community says. I think most people by now have heard that black moms and dads sit their kids down, especially boys, uh, especially when they, they're of an age to drive, and say to them, tell them exactly how to act if they're stopped by the police. Now, I was in a conference recently and someone raised their hand and said, oh, well, you know, I, I think that's just wise advice. I think, I mean, I tell my son the same thing. Nobody wants to antagonize the police, right? And was like, okay, well, that's reasonable. But your white son who stopped by the police is not going to be shot by the police, most likely. Where my black son, that's the thing that black mothers and fathers are worried about. We're not worried about, you know, police getting angry with us or any of that. We're worried about being found driving while black, being found walking, bird watching while black, you know, all of those um, things that we've seen in the news of late. Okay, so let's move on to historical trauma. So here's the definition of historical trauma. It's a multi-generational trauma experienced by a specific cultural or ethnic or racial group. It's related to major events that oppressed a particular group of people because of their status as oppressed. So examples include slavery, the Holocaust, forced migration, and the violent colonization of Native Americans. We're going to have to add to this list the uh, shenanigans that are going on at the border where kids have been separated from their parents. I'm, I'm sorry, were you raising your hand? Yeah. I just wanted to, could we add women? Um, well, if you look at the definition, I don't, don't think women would be under that thing unless it's a particular event that is associated with it. But this is cultural, racial, or ethnic. That's just the definition of historical trauma. Okay, so interestingly in the studies, they've come up with a list of things that are required. So you can look at this and see if women fit. Uh, historical trauma requires five factors. The trauma is deliberately and systematically inflicted on a target population by a subjugating dominant population. So the colonizers who colonized most of the New World, that's the dominant population and they subjugated, you know, both the enslaved people as well as natives, Native Americans, Native Caribbeans, and so on. Um, not a single event, it continues over an extended period of time, and the traumatic events result in collective suffering. Those inflicting the trauma do so with malicious intent. The magnitude of the trauma, and I think this is the most important one, derails the population. Um, so we can argue a lot about, you know, m maybe people aren't just hardworking enough, or they, if only they had done this, they would be where I am, blah, blah, blah. But the, the truth of the matter is that these historical traumas derail the population. Uh, and it affects a large group of people and is more complex than individual trauma and, re and results in a greater loss of identity and meaning. Okay, this is kind of a daunting looking uh, graph, um, but I think it's a beautiful representation of 
it's a model of historical trauma. So let's just start. I don't know if my pointer works on this, but. It does, but it oh, you can't really see it. <laughs> yeah. Okay, well, let's start at the top where it says dominant group. And then, just as we said a minute ago, the dominant group imposes things on the sub subjugating group. How do they subjugate the population? The first way is through segregating them and displacing them. So removing all of the Native Americans from their ancestral land and taking them to barren wastelands, uh, far from their hunting grounds, far from their extended you know, families and so on, refugee camps, as well as removing someone from the west coast of Africa and bringing them to America and the Caribbean. Another way that people are subjugated is through physical and psychological violence, both acute and chronic. So those who were enslaved, the women were raped, the men were beaten, families were separated, and so on. And the same thing happened to Native American and other groups. Economic destruction, loss of resources and legal rights, so hard to escape when you don't have any resources. And then cultural dispossession. So uh, interestingly, you know, the enslaved people who, who were brought from Africa were from different tribes. They had different languages. They had different customs and rituals. And the same thing with the Native Americans who were all lumped together as one. So that's what happened to the first generation who experience historical trauma. And then they have a trauma response. And the trauma response can be a physical response. You see that in the big box. Uh, nutritional stress, compromised immune system, biochemical abnormalities, like I mentioned, the methylation on uh, different genes, um, endocrine impairment, adrenal maladaptation, gene impairment, and expression. And this can lead to malnutrition, diabetes, high blood sugar, infectious disease, heart disease, high blood pressure, and cancer. Okay, another trauma response is the social response. So increased suicide risk, domestic violence, unemployment, substance abuse, child maltreatment, and poverty, which leads to a breakdown in the community and family structures and social networks. And then finally, a psychological response, PTSD, depression, anxiety, resulting in anger, aggression, social isolation, shame, loss of self-worth, a big one, right? Terror, fear, grief, withdrawal, and numbness. That's then passed on. Oh, and there can be good responses, like the development of resilience, protective factors that I mentioned earlier. And that's what happens to secondary and subsequent generations. They, they, they get the brunt of that and then it's transmitted intergenerationally. Okay, I hope that wasn't too overwhelming for you. So the studies on intergenerational trauma really started in the 1960s when people were looking at uh, the effects that showed up in offspring of Holocaust survivors. So th there was an epigenetic mark. Remember we talked about the marks on the genes? That mark was found in the glucocorticoid receptor gene, which is what manages um, stress. That, that production of uh, cortisol is part of the stress response. So there was an epigenetic marker there. And in offspring with only fathers with PTSD, that was uh, the other thing I talked to you about, methylation was elevated. So the bottom line is the summary of studies has shown that when they were higher, when they took into account the uh, presence of PTSD in, in the parents, uh, the, the offspring of Holocaust survivors showed a variety of trauma response pathology and just described themselves as feeling different or damaged by their parents' experiences whether or not their parents had shared those experiences, which most of them didn't. Studies on families of Holocaust survivors showed an association between eating disorders and Holocaust exposure, and also the transmission of trauma down to the third generation. So again, when PTSD of the parents was taken into account, there were higher rates of PTSD in association with 
the mother having PTSD, and higher rates of mood and anxiety disorder in association with PTSD in either parent. Okay, so let's look at um, America's Little Secret, which is slavery. And in our field, we know that there's been a um, lack of training, but, but more than a lack of training, as it says here, a refusal to remember, denial, dissociation, and disavowal, which are all echoed in the absence of slavery from the trauma literature and until recently from psychoanalytic literature. Trauma literature gives attention to the Holocaust, floods, earthquakes, sex abuse, rape, but not to slavery and racism. Okay. While we know that millions died during the Holocaust, few Americans are aware of the toll of slavery. There were over two million African of my African ancestors who died in the ships in the middle uh, passage crossing the Atlantic. An estimated six million more who died while enslaved. There were over 4,400 black Americans documented to have died by racial terror lynchings that lasted into my lifetime. There were many families who lost a loved one and whose family wealth was decimated in domestic terror events like the Tulsa Race Massacre. There were families who were separated by mass incarceration of black Americans, and then an almost constant stream of videos of death of black Americans by the hands of law enforcement, that many of whom have gone unrecognized and unnamed. And the murder of George Floyd was described by Harvard Business Review as the collective traumatization of black Americans. Mr. Fountain Hughes uh, was one of the last living people who had been enslaved, and he was close to 100 years when this um, interview took place, and they asked him, what would you rather be, a slave or free? Seems like a trick question to me. But. He wasn't no more than a dog, some of them. He wasn't treated as good as he treat dogs now. But still, I don't like to talk about it, because it makes makes people feel bad, you know. Well, I, I could say a whole lot I don't like to say. I won't say a whole lot, no. Mm. Which because would you rather be, Uncle Fountain? Me? Which I'd rather be? <laughs> you know what I'd rather do? If I thought, had any idea, that I'd ever be a slave again, I'd take a gun and just end it all right away. Because you're nothing but a dog. You're not a thing but a dog. Uh, that's, for me, that still resonates because I can't imagine wanting to kill myself just because I would be told one thing, that I wouldn't want to live for that very reason. So I think he, if you listen to the whole interview, which in the Library of Congress is pretty profound, some of the things that he describes happened to him in his life. So the effects of slavery today have been studied by Dr. Joy DeGray, and she's done quite a bit of research and uh, written a book called Post-Traumatic Slave Syndrome, so if we can hear that now. Post-Traumatic Slave Syndrome is an explanatory theory that really looks at multi-generational trauma. One of the things that's difficult for people is their first response is, oh my God, that happened so long ago. We're talking about people being captured, shipped, sold, beaten, raped, experimented on, and then you have to ask the question, did the trauma continue? Yes, so 300 years of trauma, no help, freed. No help, more trauma. If it's a sustained trauma, then the, the impact of that is also sustained. When we look at multi-generational trauma, we're looking at people who are maybe victims of natural disasters and their families and their children and generations of folks who have experienced war. Uh, and we know that there are residual uh, mental, emotional, traumatic impact. And what I did was I started to look at the African American experience, starting with slavery, as a real clear long enduring trauma. So I started to see that there were clear connections between that survival behavior and contemporary living in African American experience. I started to see common behaviors that I took for granted as, well, cultural. There's adaptive behaviors. 
survival behavior. Well, what are they? Let's just say 2019, you have a black mother and a white mother. The sons go to school together. They find themselves at a meeting. The black mother leans over to the white mother and says, I just wanted to mention to you that I noticed that your son is really doing quite well. And the white mother's response is, oh, thank you. She begins to go on and on about, he won the science fair, his uncle's an astronaut. She's just oozing. She realizes the black mother's son is actually excelling her son. And she says, well, wait a minute. Your son's the one that's really coming along. And the black mother responds, oh my God, he's a handful, but oh, he just works my nerves. Now, when I'm working with African-American people, it doesn't matter what the audience is. It doesn't matter what class. If I were to ask, is she very proud while she's saying those denigrating things? And everybody laughs and goes, of course, there's a secret. Because everybody black knows that even though the black mother is going, oh my God, she's really proud. So now let's roll that scene back 300 years. And let's say this black mother is working in the fields and a white slave owner comes through and says, wow, that boy is really coming along. What is she gonna say? No, he's not, he's, he's stupid, he's, he's shiftless, he can't work, because I don't want you to sell him. So I denigrate them to protect them. That is called appropriate adaptation when living in a hostile environment. The little white boy, say Timmy, you know, he feels really comfortable and happy about what his mom just said about him. And Trey looks at his mom and wonders, why can't you be proud of me? Because he doesn't understand the secret yet. And by the time he learns the secret, he will have already been injured by it. Post-traumatic slave syndrome. PTSD um, is a disorder that occurs as a result of a single trauma. You don't even have to be there to actually get a diagnosis of post-traumatic stress disorder. You could just hear about something horrific happening to someone you love. So you have people who have experienced it firsthand, people who have witnessed it in their environment, right? People who are continuing to be oppressed. That exacerbates any possibility of healing. So it's not post-traumatic stress disorder because then it becomes part of uh, what we call your socialization process. So you begin to normalize a way of living and being. Everything from what we eat to what we believe it means to be a friend. You know, all of these things are colored by history. And if you don't understand it, you're gonna fold in things that you've just assumed are normal. But post-traumatic stress disorder, you know, exaggerated startle response, outbursts of anger, a uh, feeling of foreshortened future. There was a point where there were you know, African-American children in different urban settings that didn't expect to live to be adults because they saw so much death that they started planning their funerals like at 13, 12, as young as 10. And when you start looking at the, the simple biology, you start looking at the, the impact of stress on health. And while we look at general stress, you know, we know finances, you have illnesses, all these different things. How about being black? How does factoring in being black in America impact your stress level and therefore your body's ability to operate its own immune system? Because we know it compromises the immune system. Once you understand it, then you can deal with it. Because you see, it's habitual. You socialize. It becomes a part of your being. So one of the ways you begin to address that multi-generational trauma is to work with the people it directly impacts, to hear from them. And when you give the people the information, they, they can use it. I think the first order of business is beginning to have a conversation. And the other is to educate the larger society. You have to stop the assault. So this is not purely a clinical thing. This requires social justice and change. That's where part of the healing is. It's not in a clinical setting or in a pill. It's in fairness and justice and safety and equity. We gotta work with some of those clinical things, some of those issues of panic and anxiety. And we also have to deal with the fact that you have a system that is set up to oppress you and to continue to injure you. Both those things have to be dealt with. And they cannot singularly by themselves affect a change. They have to be done collectively. So this is her book, and that's the list of <coughs> symptoms of post-traumatic slave syndrome. Um, just as she said, many times when I talk, I, I see people's eyes almost ro roll in the audience. Oh my God, here we go, talking about slavery again. And it happened so long ago and all of that. But it didn't, those effects still exist today, and we can see it 
in, for exa example, the fact that the medium household income for black people has not changed in over 70 years. And compared to whites, it's almost half of what whites make. And when you look at wealth, which is property and savings and all of that, it's even less. We know that uh, while 30% of black households have no husband present, only 9% of white households have no husband. And that harks back to the separation of the family during slavery. 27% of blacks are below the poverty line. Death rates are higher for all chronic diseases, especially COVID. African Americans are less likely than the general population to be offered evidence-based medication therapy or psychotherapy, are more frequently diagnosed with schizophrenia, and when they're diagnosed with schizophrenia, bipolar, or psychosis, they're more likely to be incarcerated than treated. Um, we know that um, the, for low-level offenses, black and American Indian youth or Native American youth are find it rates over three times the rate of white youth. So what can be done? I mean, I could go on with the statistics, you know, housing, the redlining, all of that. I, I, we just don't have enough time. Um, but I wanted to switch now and talk about how we can look at things. What can we do? So this is uh, the anti, I call it the anti-racism ball. It's about becoming anti-racist. And Ibram X. Kendi, his quote is, there is no neutrality in the racism struggle. The opposite of racist is not, I'm not racist. It's, I am anti-racist. So what's the difference? Well, one endorses either the idea of a racial hierarchy as a racist or racial equality as an anti-racist. One either believes problems are rooted in groups of people, like that's their problem, as a racist or locates the roots of problem in power and policies as an anti-racist. One either allows racial inequities to persevere as a racist or confronts racial inequities as an anti-racist. There is no in-between safe space of not racist. What's the problem with being not racist? It is a claim that signifies neutrality. I'm not a racist but neither am I aggressively anti-racist. So this is kind of like what the journey looks like is how I think of it. And I think, you know, it takes all, you can use all different methods, attending lectures, reading books, you know, talking to people you, you know who are from the BIPOC community or other marginalized groups and learning and then growing. And the growing takes introspection and commitment and it's a, ongoing process. It's not like, oh, I attend a DEI training, so I'm good. I don't need to deal with this. It's an ongoing thing. And I think the more white allies we have, the more American ca America can live up to the dream that our forefathers have stated. So I love this model. Um, Martin Broken Leg he and colleagues developed it's what he calls a circle of courage resilience model. And he trains young professionals worldwide. He's been a professor of Native American studies in South Dakota and now resides in Canada. So he talks about um, you can't teach resiliency with words or posters. And what we need are transformative experiences. And here are the four examples that show a match between findings of pioneer researchers and self-worth. So the first, significance, realizing that one matters and to, to others creates enormous strength inside that person. And that's the spirit of belonging. And the DEI work has really attached the B on to it because belonging is so important. Competence, a capable human being can learn, solve problems, and develop talents and abilities. And that's the joy that comes from mastery, strengthening your ability to master situations. Power. And this is not, not the power that's wielded over others that we see so much in the media and politics, but the ability to control one's own emotions and set the course of one's own destiny. This is what's called true independence. And finally, virtue. Ultimately, one cannot know that he or she is valued unless he or she is of value to others. 
and this is the spirit of generosity. So, I, you know, I ask you to reflect on your own intergenerational um, experiences. Where did your ancestors come from? Were they refugees? You know, many from Poland, many from uh, China, all over the world have come to America and experienced, you know, some form of um, racism or classism, sexism, misogyny, etc. cetera. Uh, what traumatic events directly affected your ancestors? When I started this inquiry some years ago, that's what led to me doing the TEDx talk. And I talk about a little bit about my journey in the TEDx talk, um, about how I got there and how I had to look back at my life and realize I kind of pretended that a lot of things that happened to me didn't happen. Or I had brushed them off because I'm a strong black woman and I can deal with this stuff. But I didn't really deal with it. And so when I was preparing to do the TEDx talk, I had my own like reckoning with my past and how I had been treated as a child growing up in the South during the Jim Crow era, et cetera, et cetera. So anyway, it's a place for you to start if you wanted to explore. The second thing I recommend beside doing your own ACE test is to do your own family genogram. A lot of young people aren't into looking at the past or what, what did my mom go through, et cetera, but it's very, very helpful. Th this is my own family genogram, and you can see a lot of the effects of trauma show up here with um, my brother who passed away five years ago as the result of his opiate use disorder. Um, my other brother who passed away just three weeks ago as a result of his substance use disorder and so on. And we can see the trauma pass from generation to generation. And we've noticed that in every generation, one of us, one of our children has been lost for some reason. Mental illness, drug addiction, um, depression, et cetera, eating disorders, all. So I'll, I think that's the end. This is uh, the Institute for Anti-Racism and Equity. I'm one of the four co-founders. And we work with eating disorder and substance use disorder treatment facilities. We've worked with, um, you know, public defenders. We're working with a group of surgeons now in North Carolina at Duke. And so we really like to go out into organizations that are wanting to make a change. And I think just, I'll say this the last thing. We worked with one particular organization for a year and a half, and when we went to, uh, just find out what the effect of that work was. There were a lot of uh, predictable things that had happened, but there were also a lot of surprises. Like people were saying, you know, that for the first time in their employment, because they may have been like um, RAs or, you know, someone not in the hierarchy, they felt that their voice was being heard. They felt like they were more part of the team. People felt that they could open up and be vulnerable. They didn't have to always be watching their back. And I think that is of value to all of us, not just people from marginalized communities. So I think this work can be powerful if, if you pursue it. So thank you for having me, and I'll take questions now. Thank you so much, Dr. Ross, for your presentation and sharing so generously, um, mm -hmm. including your own experiences. I'm very sorry for your loss. Thank you. Um, and thank you for being part of our learning in mm -hmm. our you know, attempts as a predominantly white organization to dismantle structural racism you know, a little bit at a time. Awesome. Um, so question, any questions? I'd like to start off with questions from the room. Anjali. Thank you so much um, for the presentation. I have a bunch, but I'll ask this one. You mentioned how um, when people aren't showing up to treatment, like we can't discount how race plays into that. Mm -hmm. And I know that a lot of um, therapeutic environments have like no-show fees. And so I was wondering if you know anything about like, do you just get rid of that? Or is, that, is there another way to kind of 
promote it? Well, I can so tell let me, you. Yeah. Let me repeat the question oh, just sure. so that the live stream people. So, um, we in in Dr. Ross's talk, she talked about um, the relevance of race and differences in race to things like clinical disengagement or not showing up, mm -hmm. um, and how critical the race piece is of that, and how often it's neglected. Mm -hmm. um, the question from the audience here is, I know a lot of places have no-show fees for not showing up. What do you do about that in the case where it's a person, presumably a person of color mm -hmm. as the patient coming into um, an organization and not showing up? Well, I can tell you what I do, and that is I consider no-show fees on a case-by-case -case basis. So if I do have a patient, and I, I ask them, why didn't you come for your appointment? And if someone says, you know, I had to take care of my, my sister because my mom had to work, or, you know, I, I was sick and I didn't, whatever the reason is, if I feel that it's, um, you know, reasonable, then I don't just blanket charge people for no-show fees. And I think this speaks also to the importance of being curious and getting to know your BIPOC patients in a little different way than we normally do clinically, which is, you know, just down the line, name, address, phone number, like background, da, da, da. But like, what is going on in your life? You know, how do you spend your day? How do you support yourself? Uh, what are some of the challenges you experience? What are some of the stressors that are present in your life? And honestly, it's a much more rewarding way to practice because you really have more, when you have insight, you have the ability to direct your treatments more specifically rather than just, okay, we teach everybody DBT, you know, or ACT or whatever it is. Yeah, those work. And for some people, they don't address the problem. Like I recently had a patient who said to me, she was having trouble at work. And I said, well, tell me about the trouble at work. And she said, um, and she had had a new job. She was initially, and this she's African American. She had been in treatment for an eating disorder, da da da. She was really excited initially. So the first time I talked to her, she's like, "Oh, I love it. People are so nice there." And then like a month later, it's like, "Oh, this is. I just, I'm not sure I made the right choice. Blah blah. Just really down." And finally, it came out that she felt she had to code switch, and she. So we were on the phone, so she may not have known that I was, you know, black. And she said, do you know what code switching is? I said, girl, <laughs> don't even. <laughs> so I code switched back on her, you know. <laughs> and, and when we started talking about how that made her feel, you know, most of the work we do is really about overcoming how trauma has hijacked a person's life because people really just want to express themselves and be their authentic selves. But instead, many of us who've had trauma have created a false self, an eating disorder self, uh, you know, an addiction self, and we live behind those walls, right? And so in recovery, there has to come a time where you address where in your life are you not being authentic? And that's what she was coming up against, which was great. And so we really talked about what, you know, how it felt to have to hide between, you know, speaking, so for her it was like speaking softly like a little girl, you know, because she didn't want to frighten people or didn't want people to not like her and so on. And how can we then live authentically and speak from our authentic selves? And I think that's a pivotal, you know, time in recovery that's really important to address. So that's what it means to get to know people on that deeper level rather than, okay, well, I know she's black or I know this person is, you know, lesbian or, you know, whatever. Like, what does it mean in your life? You know, so anyway. What about yeah, can you define what is code switching? Oh, well, you, you just saw white. me. You just saw me do it, right? Because I, when I went, girl, don't even go there. I went into how I talk in my home with my black family. So it's basically speaking in a different way in predominantly white mm -hmm. colonial yeah. settings, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, uh, and most white people don't 
ever have to experience that, right. um, and many don't know what it is, but it's a it's a pervasive part of the experience for black professionals. And it's automatic. Like, you know, I didn't even think about it when, when I was doing it earlier in my career. I just did it, you know. But as I became more aware, I noticed it more frequently how, you know, I was so relaxed when I could be around black colleagues and we could, you know, joke and tease each other. And then there was, you know, this kind of like, okay, well, I have to sort of put on my armor to go out here into, you know, group, groups that are predominantly white. So black people are used to doing that, like boom, boom, you know? And then I think when you become aware of it, it's, it's really useful right. to ask yourself, what purpose is this serving for me now? And I think it gets couched in like professionalism, right? Versus Ebonics, I don't know if you guys are old enough to remember, they had a whole thing about Ebonics is just, you know, kind of down, you're uneducated if you speak in Ebonics and so on. It's just different culture. So I guess along the lines of Anjali's question, you know, so I wonder if you have a sense from your anti-racism um, training work, mm -hmm. um, how often, you know, the eating disorder field, for example, blindingly white, right? Yeah. How often in those clinical spaces, when we have patients um, who are persons of color disengaged or not following the rules, yeah. are we even saying, having the conversation, what is it like to be in this predominantly white space? Or yeah. have you or anyone in your family experienced racialized trauma? Right. Yeah, and I think that's really, it's really important because we see that a lot. Um, you know, I used to do a lot of consulting with treatment facilities, and I remember getting a panic call from one of the big ones that said, well, we have a black patient, and a, a one of the white patients said something that was racist to her, and she's threatening to leave. Now what do we do? And so again, if you have developed an honest relationship that's culturally informed, then you can sit down your black patient and say, you know, how did you feel about that? Did, what did that bring up for you? How can we support you and help you to feel safe? Because what usually happens is nothing gets done or people are put in time out and told, you know, we don't talk like that and, okay, let's go to our separate corners. And then, of course, in the eating disorder world, you know, everybody's gossiping about it and taking sides. And, and that doesn't make you feel safe either. So. I think it's really important for us to have a stronger role and a stronger uh, curiosity about what people are feeling when they become disengaged. You have another question? Another question. Did I, you have a question? Or? Did you? Oh, I was going to talk about Dr. Oh, okay. All right. <laughs> okay. Okay. Yeah. I have a. You take one here, and then I have two I from. I wanted to tag on to that. So, if you have a no show, would it be helpful? Because a lot of times people say you shouldn't reach out to them. I'm just wondering, shouldn't you follow up with a phone call or follow up in some way to see what, you know, how they're doing? I mean, what would you think about that? You know, I, I think it, again, it needs to be on a case by case. If you know the patient well, I think. I've always just called them and said, hey, just checking in on you, you okay? Uh, if it's a newer patient, they may not like me or feel comfortable with me and they don't want to talk about it. In our office, we do have a, a kind of a rule that if you're gonna change doctors, for example, you have to go back to the one you didn't like <laughs> and tell them something, you know? <laughs> and I'm always really like, oh, Oh, thank you so much for telling me. I, I appreciate it, and all the best. Good luck to you. Hope, hopefully, you find what you need. Blah blah. But I think it needs to be on a case by case basis. Yeah. yeah. And so, okay, here's one from the um, internet audience or the live stream audience. Thank you so much for your presentation. How would you work with a black client who has denied the impact of racism on his access to career mobility and financial stability within his family? <laughs> I believe he does this because it's too painful to recognize the loss and powerlessness. Well, I mean, you can't um, make people have insights that they don't. So, 
when I when I confront somebody or when I have someone like that sitting in front of me, I just educate them. You know, studies have shown that da 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 da. Let's take your ACE test. Let's see where you are. Um, we know that this is related to health and mental well-being. Uh, what what can what can you identify with here? What feels relevant to you? And if it doesn't, then you just move on. Sometimes it's five years down the line, and they're like, "Oh my God, you told me this, you know, and now I'm really getting it." And da 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 da. But you can't make people have insights. So I think it's. I have a question about the role of nutrition. Mm -hmm. Right, um, particularly in light of, you know, when you think of epigenetics, when you think of genetics, um, and food as a substance that's interacting with brains. Mm -hmm. um, you know, in the eating disorder world, the standard dogma is all foods fit in moderation for all people. Mm -hmm. um, are there, you know, are there nuances that we are not regularly practicing, for example, for somebody who is, you know, a larger bodied black woman with binge eating disorder versus, you know, a underweight uh, person with a restrictive predominantly eating disorder who doesn't have diabetes or mm -hmm. hypertension. Well, um, I, I'm going to say something that may be shocking, but I think I really think food needs to be taken out of eating disorder treatment. Because binge eating, bulimia, anorexia, food addiction, I mean, I've written three books on those things. And it's not about the food. It never has been and never will be. We need to stop talking about food except just educating people about what we know. And frankly, we don't know that much. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I mean, I've been in practice for decades, and I've seen one trend after another after yeah. another. First, it's all, you know, like, uh, don't eat fat, and then it's don't eat sugar, don't eat carbs, be, eat more carbs. You know, it's just dizzying. Uh, in, what about the uh, intermittent fasting and keto and paleo? Like, I am dizzy, <laughs> and I know my patients must be, so we need to stop we need to start making food the centerpiece of our eating disorder treatment. It's interesting to teach people that food helps with the next generation because if you, if you eat healthy, your ovaries, your sperm are going to be transmitting that to the next generation. But it, you know, bulimia is not about food. Neither is binge eating disorder. That's BS. And by the way, size has nothing to do with health. I, I don't believe that. And I, I've been fighting this fight for a long time. Like, okay, well, if you weigh a certain amount, then you're going to be more likely to have with, you know, heart disease, diabetes. I'm more likely to have diabetes because of trauma than I am because of my size. You know, so let's let's yeah. stop talking about this other stuff that we doesn't never hear that. that doesn't matter. Right. <laughs> yeah. Do you ever hear a physician say you're more likely to have diabetes because no. of your ACEs score, because of historical trauma? No. Or systemic reasons. You know, it takes what, seventeen years to change anything in medicine? We're not even close to seventeen years. <laughs> And we still have so many people in our profession, right, who believe that, oh, you know, if we, we got to make somebody gain weight or we got to make somebody lose weight, why don't we help somebody heal their trauma and then see what happens? Because that's where the money is. I mean, I, I've been doing that work for a long, long time. And when people heal, they listen to their bodies because their body's no longer their enemy. When people heal, they don't need to be on a rigid diet to know what to eat. It's just, I mean, it's mind-boggling uh, boggling to me. But anyway, I could go on and on. I'll get off my soapbox right now. But. Awesome. <laughs> so here's a question related to trauma from the live stream audience. I'm a nurse who works with adolescents. How can we use the knowledge of ACEs impact on epigenetics to improve patient outcomes? Are there specific interventions that we could implement to our patients with a high ACE score? Mm -hmm. First of all, you have to get the ACE scores. And there are, I know in California, there's a woman, 
who led the charge in San Francisco though, in her pediatric clinic that every child and parent who comes in gets the ACE test. So if you know about ACE, then you can teach from that knowledge. And again, most of it is education, just like Dr. DeGray said. It's like, you tell people this stuff, and then they can use it. You know, they don't have to, you don't have to send a two-year-old to EMDR. You know, you just have to educate the mom on how are your interactions with your child governed by your own trauma or what your parents taught you and then how can we shape this differently how does your child respond when you do such and such what kind of trauma have you I mean in my family we have seven-year-olds who unfortunately have aces of seven and eight because their mom married a guy who you know, had a, an alcohol problem or was mentally ill, and they, they had domestic violence in the home, then this happened and that happened. And yeah, to the best of our ability, we try to protect our children, but we can't. But we can teach them resilience. And so that should be what we're doing with parents and with children, is teaching them resilience. And those skills will help with the trauma. Well, that is all the time we have today. Thank you, everyone, for coming, and especially Dr. Ross again for an amazing presentation. There's food for anybody here in person. Live streamers, you're on your own. Um, <laughs> but thank you. Bye, live streamers. Thanks, more for, round of thanks for joining.